Hey there, families. It's Manny Cabrera with Sidekicks Family Martial Arts. I hope that you guys are having a fabulous day. Uh, I'm really excited because I have a fantastic guest for you guys today. Um, we are going to get an opportunity to talk about all things uh, Hillsborough County Schools with the chair of the school board herself, Melissa Snively. So before I bring her on, let me tell you a little bit about her. I've got her uh, bio right here. Um, Melissa Snively serves as the chair of the Hillsborough County School Board. Uh, she was elected to the school board representing District 4 in 2014, and she's one of the seven members responsible for making policy decisions and overste overseeing a total budget of $3.3 billion for the eighth largest school district in the nation, which is also the country's largest employer with more than 24,000 employees. Um, we're not going to hold it against her, but Mrs. Snively earned her bachelor's degree from the University of Florida. I went to USF, <laughs> but uh, you know, but she's a with she had a major in English and a minor in secondary education, um, and she's been a member of the Florida Blue Key Leadership Honorary and past president of the Tampa UF Alumni Association. And Mrs. Snively has worked in the insurance industry for over twenty five years and has owned a successful. Uh, agency in Eastern Hillsborough County since 2001. Um, she has four children. Her and her, her, you know, she's been married to her husband David since 1999, and all their children attend Hillsborough County Public Schools. So join me in welcoming uh, Mrs. Melissa Snively uh, to the show. Hi, Melissa. Hello from my kitchen. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think like I, I, I think I, when we before we started talking, I think that that was kind of uh, everybody's talking from their kitchen nowadays. Yeah. Um, I do one on one calls with a, a lot of our members, and it's mm -hmm. their kitchen, their living room, wherever, wherever it is at right now. So let's let's start with you. I mean, you're at, you're at home, um, mm -hmm. obviously staying safer at home. Yes. Um, how are you guys coping with um, you know being at home as part of the safer at home stuff? Well, I think we're coping like everyone else is. I mean, um, uh, we have our moments and our a little bit of our frustrations and successes here and there. Um, three, I still have three children in Hillsborough County Public Schools. I probably need to update my my um, my resume a little bit there, my bio. But uh, the fourth one now, the oldest one, he is a college student. Um, and has come home, back home. And so he's trying to manage e-learning as a college student as well. Um, but we're, you know, we're managing. Uh, it's a little frustrating just because we're trying to have some structure and it sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. And um, some kids are self-sufficient and self-starters and some kids are <laughs> not. Uh, so. <laughs> if, if you don't mind my asking, how, how young is your youngest child? Uh, so our youngest child is in sixth grade gotcha. and he's our self starter. Ironically, the youngest one is the one um, I usually don't have to worry too much about. He is on top of his assignments and uh, uh, very, very um, scheduled and he's good. The other three, I have to do a little noodling and cajoling to get on track with their assignments. E and even, even the college one, huh? <laughs> even the college. Oh, especially the college one. Especially the college one. I guess. So. I guess. I guess wanting to sleep until noon uh, extends to e-learning too. I suppose it does. And the only upside to that, Manny, is that um, we don't have to fight for Edsby bandwidth as much at two o'clock in the afternoon as we would at maybe nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I know that. I know that uh, a lot of of uh, you know, I've seen a lot of a little bit of frustration with that. You know, starting off, it seems to start of. I guess Esby has expanded their bandwidth a little bit over time, but um, you know, I, you guys have had some uh, ups and downs, obviously. But I mm -hmm. feel like personally, I, I just want to say, like, I think that the fact that, and I and I told a friend of mine the other day that the fact that the entire district, and you got like, like in your thing here, the eighth largest district in the country, largest yeah, employer, actually, I need to update that. Seventh largest district, seventh district, largest district yeah, in the country. Uh, you know, largest, in, you know, one of the country's largest employers, and. You know, the fact that you guys in essentially five days, five working days, pivoted from brick and mortar school to e-learning, you know, says it's a lot, at least in my opinion, the, the a testament to the goal of continuing to get kids educated mm -hmm. and the fact that everybody's working towards the same thing and, and just the massive action that teachers and faculty and 
you know, the district, I think has been pretty cool. I think it's, you know, it's been really interesting to watch. It's, I've never seen the district come together quite like this. I mean, it's actually been pretty inspiring and people have had a lot of grace in um, trying to overcome some of the hurdles that we hit, you know, the first, the first week. And I must say that uh, even the superintendent, you know, is brand new. He came from a different county. First time in 50 years we've had a superintendent come from outside of Hillsborough County and he hit the ground running immediately. Well, he didn't really have a choice, but, yeah. uh, but he's been doing, I think, a really fantastic job, Mr. Addison Davis, our new superintendent, in uh, managing all of this change. Um, he's very passionate about education and students and making sure that they have um, the instruction that they need to elevate themselves to success. And it's pretty evident in his day-to-day -day interactions that that is his priority. Well, that's, that's great. I mean, he, he actually ended up having to like start a week early, didn't he? Or well, at least that's why I, I thought I read in the news or... Well, sort of, because he was supposed to start um, officially the day after spring break. Got it. Um, because the last day for Mr. Aikens was um, Friday the 13th of March. <laughs> but, I know, right, Omen? And oh, we were that, that day, too, remember? Know, yeah, that week, it was like, there were a few things going on that week. It was kind of crazy. Full moon, Friday the 13th crazy stuff. But um, but he he was supposed to start the following Monday after spring break. Well, I'll tell you what, he had to start literally Saturday of spring break and just, you know, went 90 to nothing from that point forward. So yeah, he had to start about a week earlier than normal just to try and get things coordinated and then give a week for the teachers and staff to also um, you know, get settled with e-learning and do their professional development and have some time to do their planning and make sure we had all the bandwidth in place. And, you know, and then we had to figure out meals and nutrition for students as well as electronic devices. So there's a lot going on during spring break. And unfortunately, there are probably a lot of people that didn't really get a, a real spring break uh, as they should have. But, um, but there's a lot of dedicated people in the school yeah. district. Well, I, I, uh, there, I watched a, a video, uh, you know, from the teacher's uh, at, a, at an elementary school here where I'm at in Fishhawk. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, they, uh, you know, it was, it was just all the teachers posting just, you know, how much they miss the students. And, you know, I think the, I think the biggest thing that's really made a lot of this work, even though it's, you know, I'm sure it's very frustrating at times. Cause I mean, we're mm -hmm. dealing with it with our own kids, you know, our own, you know, I got three children myself. Um, it's just how much love is coming through from the teachers to the kids, yeah. you know, because they are giving up free time. They are, learning i mean they're learning many of them have to learn new skills because i mean it's not the the, the doing things over a computer is a lot different than oh, doing yeah. things, you know in a classroom you know i don't think anyone was even prepared remotely for what was going to happen um with the e-learning but but on the flip side of that there were a lot of people who are were very willing to learn and very willing to make the change to uh, you know for the benefit of being able to continue to teach their students yeah, that's uh, that's been that's been wonderful. I mean, it's it it starts with obviously, I guess you know the leadership. So I mean, it sounds like um, you know our new superintendent, you know, he's been you know working around the clock, you know, along with you guys. Um, what? Uh, let's start with like the you know because there's obviously like I'm sure because you should probably have been on Facebook too. You know, there's a lot of different things that go around about hey, you know, this program or this program or that program. Why don't we start with one of, you know, one of the, the ones that's probably has a potential effect everyone or many, many people in need and, and many people who need it. Let's talk about the nutrition program real quick. If, I mean, if that's cool with you. Yeah, um, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and uh, my, my first disclaimer will be that we know it's not perfect. No. And there are a lot of things that we're, we're trying to, to manage that are, um, you know, we're, we're learning every, every day, almost hourly um, about, you know, uh, some of the, the, the feedback that we're getting is really good and trying to make those adjustments, you know, and yeah. superintendent Davis has been really good at listening to, to the feedback and making those, you know, being flexible and adaptive and making those tweaks where they need to, to go. So, um, so the nutrition services, you know, started kind of small and then it really expanded um, after spring break um, started. So we, the first week after spring break, um, we had a few uh, grab and go sites and then we ended up expanding the following week to about almost 150 grab and go sites and so we've fed um we've, we've given out a half over a half a million meals now to students wow. and families since the day um after spring break with the first day after spring break um so that i think it was the 23rd i want to say it 
it's Monday the 23rd. Um, so that's been um, a huge, huge effort. Um, we're trying to do it as safely as possible, you know, keep the social distancing, making sure our staff have the right uh, equipment, uh, protective equipment. Um, that's been a challenge because as you can imagine, uh, the demand for protective equipment yeah. is yeah. you know, pr pretty high everywhere. And so um, trying to get people to make sure that they have the equipment that they need to stay safe and hand out these meals. Um, that's been um, our, ne our, our next challenge. But um, and then just trying to figure out how many meals to have at each school. We've you know been trying to get people to go to their neighborhood school. They don't have to go to their neighborhood school. But we recommend that they go to the school that they would normally go to for meals right. um, and just trying to gauge how many meals we need at each school. And that changes, every, you know, day, daily, just trying to account for all the food that, that's been given out. So, you know, is there any kind of uh, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I know the answer, but is there any kind of uh, component based on need for people to go and get food or is, you know, is there a desire to, you know, only if you go, if you need it, or I mean, what is, cause like some people are like, there was a post going around, like if they don't get a certain number of meals moved, then, you know, like they're going to shut down that site. I mean, is, is there a, uh, well, I don't know if they actually shut down a site as much as they're just trying to get the right amount of meals. You know, we don't want to have um, a thousand meals at one site and then only 500 people come to or 500 meals delivered, you know. So we're that's what we're really trying to do um, um, is gauge each location to make sure that, you know, we're getting as close as we possibly can to estimating the food need at that school because we don't want to throw anything away. We right. don't want to waste anything either. But any any child up to the age of 18 um, is eligible to come and pick up meals. Actually, All right, guys, welcome back. Uh, we have a little, I mean, listen, everybody's got internet bandwidth right now, challenges. Uh, and then you, depending on the day, whether or not everybody's angry at Frontier or Spectrum. I <laughs> although, although they, a lot of them have really stepped up for education lately too. So that's been really, been really cool. So Melissa, uh, Ms. Snively, you were talking about um, we were yeah. talking about the nutrition and the, and the food. Um, yes. We were talking a little bit about the eligibility. So first one is, is ch kids who are under the age of 18. 18, yes. So uh, just because there's been a little confusion about who's eligible for meals. And by the way, my dogs have now entered the house. So you might hear them. Um, but aside from the four children, we have two dogs. So and uh, it's hard to control them from um, from barking sometimes. But anyway, <laughs> so you might hear the dogs. Um, so eligible for meals. Um, there's been some confusion because um, it, any kid, any child under the age of 18 is eligible for a meal. Um, the confusion was that when you go to a site, they're going to ask you for a student ID. Well, some children don't have student IDs. If they don't, um, if they're not enrolled in a public school in Hillsborough County, they probably don't have a student ID. Or if they're in a, um, a charter school, a private school, a home school, they may not have a student ID. Um, and that's okay. Um, but they should not be denied any meals. So the, the directive I was um, that I received from the superintendent was we're not turning people away if they show up and they want a meal and the and the children do not have to be in the car we don't want to expose the children or take them outside of the house if they don't have to be because of the the stay at home order so if a parent wants to come by anytime from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at any of the 147 sites that are available, that they are eligible for, for meals. And so they, they may get asked about a student ID, if they have a student ID that they can give at least one or, or more for students in their household, then that is, um, and that's acceptable. That's just for accountability because the government could come behind us and say, hey, we want to know who you've been giving meals to. And we have to be able to say, we gave meals to you know these students and identify who they are um, for accountability purposes. So, um, but I have been assured that if anybody gets pushed back, say, hey, you know what? The superintendent said that uh, no child is going to be turned away for a meal if they're under 18. They could be, you know, uh, a toddler or, or uh, if they're special needs students at the, and they're still enrolled in our school district, they could be up to the age of, of 22 and be in our school wow. district as a, an active student. Well, that's, I mean, that's, that's great. I mean, I, I know that there's a lot of people that, uh, you know, w before the COVID crisis were d was dealing with food insecurity. And I mean, imagine now that some are even more, you know, wow. the fact Absolutely. That especially with parents, um, you know, there's some parents who've lost their jobs, some parents that are furloughed, some parents that are not working right now, unfortunately, because of the shutdown. And so we want to take that part of the anxiety and maybe give some relief in that area. 
Um, the superintendent also is trying to figure out a way to, to bulk the meals so that parents don't have to come every day to pick up meals, that they can come maybe once a week and take a meals, that was my son and I, no. take a meal's worth of work, uh, meals worth of, uh, a week's worth of, of meals, excuse me, uh, with them as opposed to having to come day after day after day. So we're working on that as well. Yeah, because I mean, I imagine if you if you are, you know, if you are, let's say you're an essential worker, you know, because, you know, you work in, you know, in, in a grocery store or a restaurant or something, coming between nine and, and one might be a little tough every day, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, you know, listen, I, I think the flexibility has been um, been been great. I mean, I, I know that I've seen a lot of people, um, you know, because like, you know, posting because um, I mean, obviously I'm not seeing anybody in person um, <laughs> uh, uh, about, you know, about that. And so I just like, I think it's been great. You know. Yeah. And people, I mean, are, I, I think we've gotten a lot of feedback and um, people have been very, they're, they're not shy. I'll put it that way. People are not shy about telling us, um, giving us good, uh, you know, feedback and telling us how we should be doing things. And so uh, the superintendent has been very gracious and has listened to uh, a lot of that feedback and is trying to make those adjustments uh, to try and reach as many students as possible uh, with nutrition. Awesome. Um, so I, I, with, uh, you know, like, you know, Friday is supposed to be a planned holiday. It was already, it's good Friday holiday. Mm -hmm. Um, it was supposed to be a non dis non school day or non district day or something. Yeah. It's a, it's a non school day. Uh, it used to be good Friday until some of the board members decided to take that off of the calendar. Right. Yeah. You know, a whole another uh, political topic, but uh, but yes, you are correct that um, the um, this Friday is a, a holiday or a non-school day, and um, so you know we're trying to get the word out um, that there's not going to be pickup on Friday. Um, that we're going to have uh, you know we're trying to get food available so that um, people can have food throughout the weekend and not have to worry about. Um, you know, uh, the, the extra day during the weekend. So um, we're, we're going to be closed on April the 10th, but they will be trying to get those two days worth of meals out on Thursday, April right. the 9th to make sure. So, that they have access. so when they go, should they tell them anything extra or is this two days worth of food? They're just going to give them two days. We're going to give them two days worth of food. All right. Well, that's cool. I mean, I, I think that's probably going to help a lot of people. Um, again, you know, like I, you know, I'm, I'm sure everybody's had a little bit of food insecurity at some point during their, their life if they're not encountering it now and worrying about your kids is is definitely tough in the you know during these times so i think it's, it's been wonderful that the district has has continued to provide that and how quickly you guys move or how quickly the district move because i mean because uh, again like i told you before we were on on the call today you know i have a a place in uh wesley chapel which is in pasco and um you know there Hillsborough County moved way faster than I think all the you know other counties did in making sure that kids still you know got food. So tip of the hat to you guys. You know? <laughs> I did hear some of the positive feedback from thank you. I, between the e-learning and the nutrition, I did get a lot of positive feedback um, from some folks who are outside uh, on the perimeter of Hillsborough County and Pasco and Polk that said that we were moving uh, quite a bit faster than some of the other uh, school districts in Florida. Sorry about the dogs. Somebody must be outside. Ralph, hey, shh. Hi. <laughs> what kind of dog do you have? All right. They're barking, they're barking at my son who's out on the patio. Apparently. Got it. They, they want out on the patio. That's they what it want is. want out on the patio. So anyway, okay. So so yes. well, let's let's move into let's move into you know the the e learning um, the e learning topic. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I did a I had a Facebook live with a school mm -hmm. counselor you know here in the district, um, a good friend of mine, and you know we were they were talking about how school you know school. The facilities are closed, but school is not, oh, you know, school is not closed. The learning is not closed. And that's kind of right. like the, you know, the, I think that everybody. I'll mute while I, while I fix that. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> this is, you know, it's, it's all good because this is just how it's, uh, how it is right now during you know this is life right <laughs> yeah you, you remember the, you remember the video where the the kid came busting into the guy's office when he was on the bbc you remember that 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 video and connection issues again hello
Oh, looks like we lost her again. This must be is kind of there. She is faster than the last time. Sorry. So uh, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, e-learning. So you were talking about a friend who is a social worker. Yeah, well, he's a school counselor at, at, mm -hmm. a, at an elementary school here in the in the district, and you were you know we were talking about how it's you know school may be closed, but e learning is not. You know, and I guess that's been kind of the prevailing philosophy with the e-learning. Um, you know, what would you you know what would you say to a parent who maybe is you know feeling? I mean, because you as a parent are feeling the stress. Mm -hmm. you know? I'm feeling overwhelmed because yeah. I'm trying to run a business uh, out of my house. Um, I've got eight employees that are working remotely. I closed my storefront location and I'm trying to manage eight people from a distance and then still try to um, manage their, uh, their, their learning. And, and they are, uh, we're not doing that great. Honestly, it's, you know, I'm getting emails and Facebook messages from teachers about my kids and how they should be doing their, have turning in their assignment or, or did they forget to do that? Or don't forget to, they were supposed to be on the zoom and I'm, you know, like running around going, you're supposed to be on the zoom call. You're supposed to be on the zoom call. <laughs> so, uh, we're, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. And then yeah. balancing, I think what, um, cause teachers are feeling overwhelmed, but parents are feeling overwhelmed too. I think communication is probably definitely the key there. If, um, um, parents are feeling overwhelmed because they feel like their their students are having too many assignments or too much work or too many hours, and that this teachers need that feedback um, from parents, and um, and and parents also need to be patient with teachers because they're figuring it out too. They're willing to make those adjustments. Teachers are doing a great job. This is all new to them as well. Um, but they're trying to make those adjustments so that they can find that balance of what's what's manageable for students to be doing what's and what's realistic for students to be, you know, right. doing at home. What, like um, this, so what was eighth grader? Hello, eighth grader. <laughs> uh, so what would you like? What would you say to a parent, you know, who may be in the same position you know, that, that you and I are in, you know, having to work from home now? and manage their, their students and like what you know what advice would you give them you know so far but based on your experience based on your experience and you know seeing kind of the macro level as a you know part of the school board uh, i think time management is probably being tested right now by a lot of parents because they're trying to have you know trying to manage what they their workload whatever that might look like um in a house full of um kids or animals or spouses and you know just because just because i'm here doesn't necessarily mean i'm available to them every single minute and i think that's the 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 tangible aspect of that is is challenging um you know take a deep breath um go outside and uh, walk down the, the, the street and, and come back for a minute <laughs> and get some fresh air um take a lot of take a lot of little breaks and and the kids need that too you know you don't want your kids staring at a computer for you know eight straight hours that's not normal for them to be couldn't be normal for them to be doing um uh, doing that uh, for classwork and well, so um so still I mean, be before, uh, you know, March, what was it? Before March 13th, before Friday the 13th, uh, everybody was like, we got to get our kids off the computers. We got to get our kids away from the tablets. We got to get, and now we're all like, you know what? This is, you know, at least we're using it for positive things as opposed to endless hours of. Uh, right. I think they're learning. Yeah. Maybe they're on um, more for Zoom meetings in their class as, as yeah. opposed to, you know, Minecraft or, or Roblox or whatever yeah. they're doing, what, whatever um, they would normally do. There. You know, when, when, uh, you know, when students are, you know, on those Zooms, how critical is it for like, uh, you know, for there to be a parent helper nearby? I mean, like, if you, have you guys talked about like, if there's any rules that you want, you guys want the teachers to try and, you know, request parents be nearby or, in, you know, just whatever it takes to make it happen. Like what guidelines has, you know, has the district kind of given, you know, the, the For teachers. Well, I know that Zoom is probably the most popular meeting platform, but they are, uh, there are other meeting platforms that can be used like Microsoft Teams and, and things. Zoom happens to be probably one of the easier ones to use. Um, we've had to, um, to, to, to make sure that Zoom has upped their security. We had some issues with security and people, um, um, you know, bombing Zoom meetings, um, which 
now, by the way, and um, we want to make sure that uh, teachers set up the Zoom meeting with security and uh, so that you can't, not anybody can just, you know, figure out how to get into a Zoom meeting. And so um, uh, I would suggest that, you know, parents be nearby those meetings uh, just in case. I think it's always a good idea for a parent to be close by if that's if they are available to do so. Um, uh, and, the, the, you know, some of my my kids, you know, kick me out of the, of the room because they don't want to want they don't want to see me. And like that would be like me visiting their classroom, right, right. Going to their classroom with all their friends and all their class and uh, they're embarrassed by that. So most of the time I I'm, I'm, I have to stay at least uh, a social distance six foot away from them um, <laughs> off, so off that I'm camera. not remotely near the camera. Yeah. Right. You just, you know, especially, especially, in, you know, before we uh, all get, you know, get on camera ourselves for, for work. Hey, we did have one comment from a, I get from a parent. Um, so Tamika, she mm -hmm. says, Melissa, I appreciate your honesty and sharing your struggles with the e-learning, uh, know that you are not alone. So that was really fun to her. I think we're all in this together. We're all trying to figure out, you know, how to balance it. Um, uh, I'm a little, you know, I'm, I'm afraid with some of my kids and not with other of my kids. Some handle it, some can't handle it as well. So it's just a, I think we're all pulling out our hair a little bit. Um, but, get, you know, cut yourself as a parent. I say cut black kids, cut yourself some slack. You know, this is week two, so we're, we're we might we don't know if we're going to go back to school or not. Or if it's, is this going to be the norm for the rest of the school year? So um, you know, take a deep breath, and and we're all in this together. And that's the thing I think that I really enjoy about you know, aside from the fact that we're in a pandemic, um, and that's not great, but the fact that. Um, for a while there, it seemed like we were all doing our own thing. Like parents were going in one direction, students were going in another direction, teachers were going in another direction, and nobody was on the same team for a while. And that's something that yeah. it could be generational. Um, that's that's it was very disheartening to see some of that. And so to now it feels like, hey, you know what? We are all on the same team now. It's almost like this is you know destiny for us to try and hit the reset button on the relationships that we have with our teachers and really appreciating all that the teachers do for students and um, and appreciating what the students are learning every day and, and appreciating the parents' participation in the students' learning. Well, it's, I, 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 I wholeheartedly, you know, agree. I, um, it's, it's, everybody's on the same side of the fence now. Everybody's you know, got the same, you know, hey, this is not what anybody expected. You know, let's all work together to, to make the, you know, make the best of it. Um, you know, I did have some questions from, uh, you know, parents, because like, you know, one of the things that we we do in our in our program is that I would say, uh, uh, you know, we have a good portion of our student body that is neurodiverse, you know, that they're, you know, they, you know, they have varying, um, you know, varying things like ADHD and, and some are on, you know, on the autism spectrum. Um, and, and, you know, they have, uh, uh, you know, are the resources that they were, you know, using when they were in person at the school, are those kinds of things still available to them? Are they still able to, you know, like, are there IEPs and 504s or all those still in effect? How does, like, now we're doing everything over the computer, how does that change or affect the way that, you know, they are doing things? You know, like how? Like, yeah, that's probably one back. of the most challenging uh situations, you know, as far as that goes. Now the parents are, you know, full time um, uh, teaching from helping to teach, you know, helping to manage a child uh, from home. Uh, but the IEPs still have to happen and the meetings still have to happen. And uh, I know that the superintendent um, has uh, uh, made, he's trying to make sure that all of the, the um, personnel who help the students who have IEPs or 504 plans or special needs are um, helping to man helping the, the the parent with the management of of their child and the learning of their child. And so, mm -hmm. um, I think one of the unique things about this virtual learning environment too is um, because we're not in person. 
you'll see that there are some students in a, you know, if they say you have a class of, you know, uh, 20, 20 students, and some students are going to learn at a faster pace than others do. And normally, maybe you wouldn't have the ability for um, uh, a teacher may not have the ability to stop and help a student um, who's having a challenge. Um, because they have to keep going. But now you've got students who are learning at different paces and they may be able to go on. And, and then now a teacher might actually be able to do some one-on-one -on -one or small group with their students that they may not have had the ability to do um, previously. And so for the students who have special needs, whether it's ADHD or um, dyslexia or and any other learning challenges, um, I'm, I'm thinking and I'm hoping, and I haven't heard from um, many ESC teachers, but what I'd love, I would love to hear from them if they're having the time, if they feel like they're, they're having the time and the resources that they need to help those students that need the additional attention. So, I mean, would, I mean, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to put you on, on the spot, but I mean, would who are they, would they just, should they go to their, to their area supervisor? I mean, would you want to hear from them directly? I mean, well, depending on who they normally work with at the school, right. I think we, I always tell people to start with the site administrators because, you know, those are the people who have boots on the ground. And so if they feel like they're struggling, if a parent feels of a special needs child or a child with an IEP or 504 plan and feels like they're really struggling, I would reach out to, um, you know, the, the school the school counselor, um, the principal or the assistant principal and express the the sentiments that they have and see what they can do from the site level. And then if, if they still feel like they're not um, getting what they need as far as resources are concerned uh, to be successful with their students' education, then they may need to take it you know, one step further um, to the area superintendent or to the um, district um, ESE. Uh, director. And so, uh, but I always say, if you can start at the site level, give the principal and the site administrators the opportunity to help solve those challenges first right. before you start making phone calls to, you know, district administration. Right. No, that's, I mean, that's entirely fair. Um, and teachers, you know, how they've been given a lot of flexibility in to be able to, to do the varying paced instruction or, I mean, how, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess it depends on as a teacher how you interpret it. But we'd like to think that, you know, the superintendent has given them the, the flexibility that they need to, to do the job that they need to do. And so uh, I'm getting a lot of different feedback. I mean, I've, I've heard some teachers that where parents feel like they're the teachers assigning too giving too many assignments for one subject. And then there's some teachers that, um, you know, don't get on to Edsby very, very often. And now they're they're going to have to get more um, you know, comfortable with Edsby and using Edsby. So it's quite the gamut of, of experience with teachers. And I think the superintendent is trying to get all the teachers on the same page. And that's really challenging. We have 16,000 teachers across the wow. school district, right? With varying degrees of experience and um, not just subject matter experience and um, education and, and instructional experience, but um, technological experience as well. And so I think it's going to take, you know, again, week two. So um, I think it's going to probably take for the rest of the, it'll probably take the rest of the school year. And I'm sure by the time the, the last day of school comes around, everyone will be. Yeah. We're going to have like the last day of school. We're going to have like the best day perfect. of learning. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I'll give you an example of just one of the learning, you know, a specific example of, of e-learning. One of uh, one of my clients, you know, you know, we were talking about their, you know, their e-learning experience over Zoom. And they were talking about how like their child had an e had a Zoom meeting with five of his teachers at 11 a.m. Oh. It's like, well, he's only going to make it to one. Right. Yeah. I, I think that that afterwards, too? afterwards, I think they've all sorted it out. But mm -hmm. but you know, like just initially, you know, like you know, okay, well, you know what, we actually may need to coordinate with other teachers. And I think it's happening. I just right. think that, you know, sometimes initially the people are going to be a little bit frustrated and then yeah. that's going to cloud their entire view of the, the whole e-learning experience. And it's never, I mean, I, I, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but like, this is not meant to be a replacement for brick and mortar learning. Like this is not meant to be, you know, this is, you know, a, 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 a you know the the way forward as far as what you know you guys as a as a as a district believe that this is going to to yeah. be. I mean, sure, there could be a virtual component to things, mm -hmm. but just like 
you know, my, you know, my martial arts program, I mean, it's not my intention to do martial arts over the internet, you know, no. forever, you know. <laughs> yeah. right, right. No, that's true. I mean, that'd be pretty hard, I think, to do over the, to do. Yeah, well, I mean, you have to actually, like, you actually have to actually, like, touch other people at something. Yeah. <laughs> like, there, there has to be other people involved. Right, uh, right. I, I guess uh, Mike Tyson has a great saying, it's like, everybody has a great plan until you get punched in the face. And like, <laughs> That's great. That's, you gotta learn. That's kind of how I feel. You know, everybody's got a, a plan and, until you get punched in the face. And so uh, that, you know, I think this will definitely alter education, like from this point forward. It'll, I think it'll be a very, um, uh, a moment in time where it's kind of like, well, before coronavirus, education after coronavirus. Right. And I think that there's going to be definitely some components of education that um, will change, will change uh, because we have realized the um, availability of instruction on a virtual basis. And ideally, it, yes, face-to-face, -face, most people prefer, I think, face-to-face -face instruction, but, it, but there are some things that can be done virtually. And, and, and we, when we talk about our vision and our mission and preparing students for life, um, this is part of it, right? This is part of how we're preparing our students for what happens after they cross that graduation stage. Um, because the because we've seen that not just school and education is going to change because of this, the way everybody does business, a lot of businesses are going to change their structure and their business model because of this. And so, um, so I think that this 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 um, ex I wouldn't call it an experiment, but this this adventure that we're going through together is definitely going to change the face of education from this point forward. Well, I mean, I was thinking, I was thinking about it as like, you know, this is, this is probably the first mass, uh, uh, I mean, because I mean, let's face it, a, a, every district in the country and many, you know, many places around, um, you know, around the world, I think that, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of people who are, uh, uh, you know, who are going to understand this, you know, understand this process. And then should there ever be uh, an emergency situation, mm -hmm. you guys now have a, I mean, pretty much a battle hardened plan mm -hmm. you know, in order to implement. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if you recall a couple of years ago when we had uh, the hurricane that came through here in Tampa. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, the district was down for two weeks. We were, and we were, and, and now we know that we are more nimble than we thought we were, right? And so that if that happened again, and it wasn't, if you recall, the hurricane, you know, it wasn't the hurricane per se that, that was keeping kids out of school, that it didn't hit our area, but because we have, um, most of our schools are evacuation centers and shelters, we were sheltering people from other parts of Florida that were directly impacted by the storm and the hurricane. Right. Um, exactly. And we, you know, then kids lost instructional time because of that, but maybe not in the future. Maybe now if we have to have our schools as shelters for two or three or four weeks, that doesn't mean we stop learning because now we have a backup plan. We know that we can do a virtual education for a short period of time, not permanently, but for if we have to, we know we can do it for a few weeks again if we have to. Right. Um, so we have a uh, we have a comment is from a Facebook user. Um, I, I don't I, can, I don't know their name because they got commented in one of the groups because we're actually live in uh, 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 two Facebook groups and two Facebook pages and on YouTube. Okay. No, right. oh, oh, it's like it's high. It's fancy. You are fancy. <laughs> but um, but this person says that if you if your child has an IEP, you as a parent should know their case manager's name. And that's all probably true. Mm -hmm. um, that teacher and the ESC specialist at your school, they can reach through EDSBE, through the school's website and by EDSBE. Um, and, you know, teachers are trying their best to navigate the situation and accommodate all the students to the best of ability. And that's, I agree. That's totally true. Absolutely. Absolutely. So again, we're all in this together. That's great information. Um, every, everyone should know their case manager's name um, already. And so, uh, as I said uh, previously, you know, let the site, hopefully everyone is, um, you know, managing it. We're all in this together, but uh, let reach out to the school site and the administration and the, and the teachers on this at the school site first. So, and work with them if you're frustrated, if, if you are a frustrated parent, but most of us are frustrated right now. So. Yeah. I am. Um, so, you know, you mentioned a little bit like, you know, obviously this is going to go on for several weeks, you know, you know, we huh. don't necessarily know when the uh, uh, definite end is. I mean, obviously, you know, we all have hopes that, you know, April 30th comes around and, and, you know, miraculously, we're going to be able to go to school. But I mean, realistically, you know, how um, 
you know, what is, what are you guys doing? You know, what, if you can share some kind of with some of the plans mm -hmm. for some sort of like, what is the sustainable road that this looks like is, you know, how long is, you know, obviously is nutrition is going to continue, you know, and so this is over or, you know, is there any plans? We do. We work closely with the federal government for nutrition, um, making you know to make sure. So we we are in constant contact to make sure that we can continue nutritional services for students. I anticipate that if we had to do that, we could do that through you know the rest of the school year, um, and that we would get support from from the um, you know from the federal government for nutrition services. So I think the hardest part for folks right now, and and what people feel the most for our seniors, because our seniors have um, their missing a lot of, of senior activities. They're not going to get to do some of the, the traditional senior um, um, events that they normally would do, like prom, for example. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't think anybody had prom before um, spring break, but uh, if they did, they were lucky because um, I don't think most of the high schools um, are going to have prom that I'm aware of. And then graduation. We still have graduation. Um, it is still scheduled to happen. We're, we're hopeful um, that uh, that we could still have it at the same time in the same location and, and the same plan until until we are told otherwise or instructed otherwise by the governor or the Department of Education. We're going to keep graduations um, on. However, uh, I know that the superintendent had a working group made up of, of students, parents, teachers, and administrators that came up with plan B, C, D, and E, in, just in case we are not able to um, have traditional graduating ceremonies uh, when we had, you know, originally scheduled right. that. So, um, and, and then... Um, um, electronic devices. We didn't really talk about that. That's probably been one of our other big challenges is um, the the technical divide, the technological divide of the haves and the have nots um, when it comes to um, having accessibility to technology. And so we have um, really uh, the superintendent has done a great job of um, distributing electronic devices. We know that there's more work to do because sometimes one is not enough for a family. We've already distributed over 35,000 electronic devices. Wow. We, we, we've checked them out. They're still property of the school district, and we're hoping to get them back in the similar condition that they were checked out to families. Um, and we still have about 35,000 more on, on order, 40, almost 40,000 more on order. Um, um, and that we continue to distribute and they, they're coming in, they're kind of trickling in as they are being prepared for students. So by the time this is over, we will have um, checked out probably 75,000 electronic devices to, to different families. Um, and then of course, Spectrum and Comcast are working with us and we purchased um, 500 hotspots recently to try and figure out where we're having connectivity issues because not everyone is in a location that has internet accessibility. And so that's been a challenge as well. That makes sense. I mean, is there, you know, I, I sometimes when you're like, when you're in places, you know, there's like, um, you know, like there's you know, like over the air cable, you know, like cable Wi-Fi stuff like that, you know, where they're just broadcasting for, for clients. You know, have you heard anything from those companies about giving people access to that at least, you know, to give them, you know, in, into the networks? Um, well, I know Spectrum ha is trying to work with, um, with, um, uh, families to, to give internet access um, for, well, for free. Um, there was some challenge in the beginning because if people had a Spectrum account, I believe that they had to close out any balance due on their account before they were able to um, reopen a, spe a Spectrum account. But, um, but the, you know, they're, from what I understand, they right. are now free of charge for, um, for students and families to have that accessibility that they need. Um, and then there's, there's still, unfortunately, pockets of students who don't have internet access, even with spectrum and the hotspots and, and things like that. Um, and I just wanna assure our families that, um, and our parents, that if they are one of those families, that the um, paper pack, there are paper packets that can actually be, you know, some worksheets and some paper packets that can be put together at the beginning of the week that can be picked up at the school and then returned um, at the end of the week to the school for, for grading. Um, so 
yeah, we're just trying to come up with different ways of reaching everybody and it's, it's challenging. So we're still yeah. looking for that feedback that we need from people to, to figure out, we don't want any kids to slip through the cracks. And that's the biggest fear. I think the superintendent and the board have is how do we reach every single student in an equitable way? Yeah. I, and I think that's, I mean, I think that's fair. Cause I mean, this has definitely been uh, uh, an upheaval. We do have a, a couple of comments. Um, so I guess the first one is, is with all of the uh, uh, stuff, you know, the, this conversion to e-learning, I guess this person's, this person's question, again, can't see them because of the uh, privacy on Facebook, but uh, will there be summer school? I mean, will... Not that I know of at this point. Um, there has not been a an announcement about summer school um, as far, uh, unless... It, in addition to what they're doing now. Now there's traditional summer school. There are some students who would normally go to summer school. Um, so as far as I know, that's still um, scheduled, but nothing out of the ordinary for the for the students who don't need summer school. There's not going to be an extension of school. I, I think that's what the, yeah, I, think, I, I hope that's I think that, might, that, question. that might be it. But I mean, so summer school for people who need summer school because of the normal reason why you would go to summer school, right but no plans right this moment that when we're done on May 28th or 29th or whatever it is. Right. That no extension of, yeah. of school. So it's not going to be like right. making up hurricane day, like we would have to make up hurricane days or something right. like that. Correct. Cool. Correct. So so is, we're still getting in the instructional time that kids need. Um, you know, there's still going to be grades. Um, some things have been waived. Assessments have been waived. Um, for graduation, though, the students still need to maintain a grade point average and the amount of credits that are required for graduation. So I will throw that in there in case people are wondering about graduation. Yeah, I am. Um, so uh, well, I guess this is, might be an, another follow up question that, uh, you know, we mentioned the seniors and how, how difficult, it, you know, some of the stuff that they're missing. But they're also trying to navigate, you know, the uh, uh, you know, the application to colleges and, and, you know, interviews for those things. And um, all staff is still working, like their guidance counselor at, at their school, they can still contact their guidance counselor and still get guidance that way. You know, if they need records, they can still get records. Um, really, nothing has changed. It's just that you, you may be like this, we may be talking to them in their kitchen. Right, you know? right, right. Yeah, every, every uh, staff person, every faculty member um, is still working and um, should be available to try. And even though it's not the traditional way of doing things, but try trying to help students navigate through some of that. Um, I did get a question the other day about um, bright futures because there are, you know, there's a certain amount of, of volunteer hours that are required and a certain um, you, you should be allowed to take your SAT or ACT score all the way up till June 30th. They take scores for that to qualify for Bright Futures. And so as far as I know, the state legislature and the Department of Education haven't changed anything. But I, I saw a petition going around with a lot of signatures on it. And I have a feeling that there's going to be some accommodations made for students who are not able to um, may get those um, last few hours in that they may have needed or take that SAT or ACT test one more time before they needed. So um, we'll be, I know that the superintendent's going to um, to go to bat and advocate for the students in Hillsborough County. Hopefully they, they will all do that and um, allow some accommodation where that's concerned. Yeah, uh, looks like we have some more comments and then, you know, we'll, we'll finish up with your final thoughts and, and you know, let you uh, get on with your day. I'm sure you're busy. Oh. Well, yeah, you know, I just got to make sure my kids, um, I got to go check Edsby. So. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody else, I got to go check Edsby. Yeah, so this uh, commenter, she said, or he or she says, uh, I don't know about the entire county, but our teachers at Beavis are doing an amazing job engaging kindergarten students with daily videos, story time, and assignments. Hats off to all the teachers in Hillsborough County for adjusting to learning or online learning. It's awesome. Yes, definitely kudos. Cool. Kudos to the, and I'd like to think that all the teachers across the school district um, are, are doing similar things to engage their uh, kindergartners and their elementary school students. And I'm going to plug a school board member right now, Dr. Stacy Hahn, who is a school board member in uh, representing District 2. She has started something um, called uh, Storytime Online. And if you go to the Hillsborough County Public School uh, website or you go to her Facebook page, um, every day, every weekday at 11 o'clock, she does Storytime Online. And that's another activity that um, our kindergarten, our kinder or actually our elementary school students, any of our element elementary school students can 
engage in. Um, it, it's it's fun and it's free and it's um, you know a way that um, promotes literacy for our students. So story time online with Dr. Stacy Hahn. That's awesome. Uh, we got one more comment, and, and you know what? This is um, I guess this 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 kind of goes along with some of the stuff that you were saying earlier about testing. Um, this person asked, uh, what about it was said all children would be moved on to the next grade unless parents choose to hold them back. Is that still true? That, that is still true. That is still true. That hasn't changed. Um, let me see if I've got anything on. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. I don't have anything specifically new on that subject. That is the last thing that I heard. Um, so, um, so students, um, I will go on to the next grade unless parents choose to hold them back. Uh, I imagine that um, we're so close to the end of the year. Hopefully um, parents feel comfortable, you know, uh, ag agreeing with what their teacher has decided if that student should graduate to the next level. Uh, I think we depend a lot on our, our, obviously our teachers to help determine whether a student's ready for the next grade or not. So, but that's still, that's still true. So teachers are, are still in the driver's seat of that, you know, of that process. Um, you know, they can make the recommendation to stay back or, you know, it, based on kind of, I guess, I mean, whatever assessments are being done internally as the school, because there's not going to be state inside the state, like statewide assessments. Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and, you know, fortunately this happened, I mean, think about the timing of this, you know, um, uh, fortunately this happened towards the end of the school year. Can you imagine if this happened in, you know, September or October um, and we would all be trying to wrap our heads around whether or not children would, are progressing or are gaining as far as learn, learning is concerned. And so, um, you know, not that, not that having a pandemic is fortunate, but the timing of it, if we could have timed it, this would be, it's better to have it at the end of the year than to have it at the beginning of the year, because right now there's a lot of assessments that would be um, being prepared for and happening from now until the end of the school year. So the instructional time is much more important from um, August to now than, than maybe from now until the end of the year. Yeah. I mean, yeah, definitely. I, I, uh, I think that's probably, you're probably on the, on the right track there. I, you know, I, I think that for uh, a lot of people, I guess maybe, you know, if they feel like their child needs to be held back, they were already something that they needed to, like, there was already kind of knew that there was something that needed to be done. And then this was just another setback to being able to accomplish or catch up and, and you know, to what needs to be done. Yeah, possibly. Possibly this could be um, uh, shed some light on whether a student was, um, you know, ready for the, conti you know, continuing on or if it would be better for them to, to stay. Um, and, you know, although we do depend on um, teachers to drive, like you mentioned, uh, it is ultimately a, you know, a, a parent's decision um, at the end of the day, but um, I would hope that parents and teachers would work together to determine what's best for the student based on all the information that they have, um, you know, together. So. Right. Yeah. I mean, still goes back to that communication part that we were talking about at the beginning, yeah. um, you know, making sure that their, you know, lines of communication are, are uh, you know, are open. Mm -hmm. um, so, Melissa, is there anything else that, you know, that you think that is important for parents to know right now uh, while you have, you know, you kind of have their, you talk directly to them, you know, tell sure. them. Sure. Um, I think we've all talked about attendance a little bit. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're, um, there's not really a way to take attendance on a day-to-day -day basis. I have gotten some questions about whether attendance is going to count. Um, the teachers are recording attendance on a weekly basis. Um, they're trying to make sure that they're, you're, they're touching base with students on a regular basis, whether it's day-to-day -day or week-to-week. -week. Um, but, um, but you know, that's how attendance is working right now. So nothing's being held against a student. Um, but I will tell you, if a teacher hasn't heard from a student in a, in, within a week that, that, that you know, red flags go up and um, the teacher is going to uh, try and make an attempt to reach that student and make sure that they're staying on track. Um, EDSB, even though it's a little challenging, um, they we've worked out some of the kinks. It's not perfect, but that's probably the best way of communicating between uh, teachers and students and parents to make sure that um, everyone is on the same page with regard to the um, to the e-learning. Um, we're going to get better every day. Uh, this is all still very new to everybody. And so I just want to, you know, hopefully give people some encouragement that 
again, give yourself some grace. It's only week two um, where we haven't even finished two weeks of this. Um, we know it's very challenging for families, but we all want them to know that the school district is here. The teachers, the administrators, the school board, the superintendent are very committed to, to making this work for students. And um, uh, uh, we, you know, we, we don't know what the future holds. We're going to wait to hear what the, the governor and the Department of Education decides. But whatever it is, we're going to try and respond to it as positively as positively as we can and make sure that the teachers and the parents and the students have the resources that they need to at least, you know, get through however much longer this e-learning experience is going to be for them. So we're here. We want to help. We're listening. We're really trying to make those adjustments based on the feedback that we get from, from parents and teachers. So keep it coming. So, yeah, I, that's, I, I think those are some great sentiments. You know, I, um, Kind of the, the the thing that I've been telling my own team is that we are really firm in the goal. You know, like like you got you mentioned what the mission was. You know, we're really firm in the goal to help a, a, a help children to become the best version of themselves through martial arts. How we get there, you know, we've got to be flexible and adaptable. And that was you know we we in our in our own members Facebook group for all of our, our members, like me and my wife, who just walked in a couple seconds ago, mm -hmm. uh, we've, done, we've taken to doing like daily Facebook Live updates because things changed so fast over the last few weeks that like we would listen to the 130 call that you guys would do, like uh, the EP, emergency policy group would do. And then like, okay, how to, and then interpret the, you know, what happened and, and, mm -hmm. and how that affects us. And then, you know, come back to our, our, our team or our members. But um but like, yeah, it's, 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 it's remain flexible. Yeah. I, um, let's see. I will, can I plug one more uh, school board member while I'm on? Yeah, you, can, you can plug whoever you want. <laughs> Their, uh, Vice Chair um, Steve Kona. Uh, he represents, I think, District 5. Um, and he does a 3 o'clock update every day from Monday through Friday. And it's a Facebook Live, and it's like maybe 15 or 20 minutes. But he'll answer questions. He'll, um, you know, entertain comments and feedback. But um, if you go to his Facebook page at Steve Kona, he does every day at three o'clock. Um, he does an update, and so you can watch it live or you can, you know, watch it later. But that could be helpful for um, for things that change on a day to day or an hour to hour yeah. basis to get those updates. Well, that's great. Um, we, you, before we got onto the call this or earlier. Um, you and I talked about some uh, phone number resources. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, if you're having trouble with like e-learning support, uh, what kind of calls would they take for like, I mean, obviously if mm -hmm. you need, if there's something we, you need to talk to your teacher about the actual education, what kind of calls would go to the e-learning support type thing? Um, I think e-learning support would be um, questions about, um, you know, the instruction and not necessarily the the platform because the technology support is going to fall. You know, if you have some some EDSB issues uh, with bandwidth or with um, uh, technological errors, that's going to be where you're going to find technology. Or if you need a device or, you know, something of that nature, hardware, software, that's the technology support. But um, for e-learning support, uh, you know, if you need some help navigating um, maybe even even navigating a little bit through Edsby, but um, but getting support uh, where it comes from, you know, question, questions about um, the actual uh, um, assignments that are being given out. Um, that could be some support for for those families. Or if you're you know if you're a frustrated parent and and, and you want to just give some feedback about the amount of work that that you're seeing or the lack of it, then that would be a, a good phone number to call as well. Cool. Uh, also on here, you, you know, there's some general questions. One, mm -hmm. and then um, that was the last component that my, you know, my friend really wanted to emphasize was mental health. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because yes, there are going to be feelings of isolation. There are going to be sometimes feelings of overwhelm, and uh, you know, if if there's if they need to talk to someone, that's definitely one to yeah. to reach out. Well, uh, and you know, right now it's still um, a little bit of a novelty, and people are, you know. Um, um, they're trying to adjust accordingly and be flexible. Um, but we could get to a point two or three weeks from now where you're feeling a little bit of cabin fever or you're, um, you know, there's a lot of issues that, that, and, and kids could be, 
uh, feeling trauma or fear or uncertainty. And we want to make sure that we have mental health support uh, services available for any parents or families that are feeling that stress or feeling that fear and they need to to talk to somebody they need counseling we want to encourage people that they're not alone and that we're we can do this together and that there are services available for their mental health i am um, I'm, I'm kind of been talking to people about uh and you i know that you are you're involved in scouting uh for a long time that you know when you go on a camp mm -hmm. this is like the second day of camp it's still fun but day four is gonna get a little bit weird you know yeah yeah um, it's really and you're ready to go home and <laughs> yeah you know. i'm tired you can't sleep well on the you know yeah. in the tent on the ground yeah. But, yeah so we might feel a little bit of that weariness in a couple of weeks especially if this gets extended to the end of the school year. Um, so uh, again, take a deep breath, have grace. If you need to talk to somebody, make sure that you're getting the, the counseling and the mental health support that you need to get through this, um, this time. Cool. All right. Well, um, Mrs. Snively, I, uh, Melissa, I appreciate uh, all the time uh, that you spent with us today. I hope that this was um, useful and helpful and, you know, reassuring that the, you know, the county, the school district is not, you know, is is definitely in your corner. You know, I mean, that, you know, sometimes you, you may, people may think that, well, there's these requirements that we got to do because it's public school and we got to do it. But really, the, the goal is just that we take off all these boxes. The goal is, is that we help each, you know, that you got help each individual children or child that, that is in the system, you know, in the school district. And, um, you know, I appreciate your efforts. Certainly appreciate the, the efforts of superintendent and the rest of the school board. And then definitely every single teacher that uh, uh, that we encounter, because many of our members are teachers and, and bring their children to our program. And, um, you know, they I know they're working very, very hard, um, just, you know, to make everything to work during this time. And so thank yeah. you so much for coming in and talking to us. And, um, you know, if you just hang tight for just a second, I'll end the broadcast and uh, we'll wrap up. Cool beans. Thank you. Thanks for having me on today. I appreciate it. All right, guys. Thank you so much for participating in our, our call today. Um, it was Melissa Snively, chair uh, chair of the school board. Um, right here on the screen, you can see some numbers for to gain support. And certainly um, remember to give yourself a little bit of grace. You know, give yourself a little bit of flexibility when it comes to the e-learning. And uh, thanks for tuning in and, and watching us today and, uh, and bearing us with us through some technical issues. Uh, because like like everybody else, we're, we're learning this process too. So thank you guys. Ha have a powerful day. Actually, I take it back. Make it a powerful day. You get to choose uh, how you respond to situations. And um, we'll talk to you guys soon.